<laughs> He's got a parrot. <laughs> it's the bird emergency, and we've got some cockies in the background. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. On my, oh, I don't know, over there is Dr. <laughs> Maggie Watson, who is an ornithologist at Charles Sturt University, bird nerd, and a bit of an expert on the, the content today. And down there, I feel like I'm on the braid. <laughs> Dr. Holly Parsons, the manager of the Urban Birds Program, better, better known as... Birds in backyard. Hello, Holly from BirdLife Australia. But we're, uh, are we retiring the birds in backyards? Is that what's happening? Or? No, no, no. Birds in backyards are still in existence. So it's the program within Urban Birds that's all about how people can create bird friendly gardens and take part in garden bird surveys. So it still yeah. exists. It is still up and running, well and truly. We've just blossomed out to encompass some other programs as well. Well, that's what we like to see, BirdLife Australia growing its reach, growing its reach. We're going to talk about how to be friendly to birds. We've done our, we've done our gardens one. We've done, we've done our sort of plant selection and we've done our hollows. Today it's about how can you do the right thing if you do have to get rid of some pests in your domestic situation and further agricultural or horticultural, your factory, whatever. And, of course, there was quite a bit of conversation about rodenticides and what what was planned. So perhaps who wants to introduce that situation about the broad-scale control of rodents in our current mice plague? You want to do that one, Maggie? Sure, uh, no problem. So the uh, house mice, mouse, came to Australia probably in the late 1700s, but the first documented plague was in the early 1900s. Probably there were plagues before, but people just really didn't bother to, to do too much documentation on it. Plagues are a way of life for a lot of Australian animals, different types of, of rodents plague, different types of insects plague. It's just their response to the boom and bust cycle that happens here in Australia because of, of rainfall. So the mice aren't doing actually anything bad in that sense. But when, when you have a mouse plague that exceeds the, the comfort of, of humans, especially farmers, then you start losing a lot of crop and livestock and all the furnishings in your house and they run across your face at night. And yeah, it's, it becomes pretty disgusting pretty fast. And so we have a series of lethal controls for them. The ones that were developed before 1970 are called first generation and the ones that were developed after 1970 are called second generation. The first generation poisons work exactly the same as the second generation poisons, except the second generation poisons tend to be much more long lasting. They're no more lethal than, any, than each other, but they're longer lasting. So first generation poisons are things like warfarin. If, you, if you've got heart trouble, you might take a little bit of warfarin to thin your blood out. And Kumatril, these are anticoagulants. They make you bleed to death at the right dosage. And they generally take about three days to to work, three to seven, depending on how much you eat. Generation can just, poisons. Can I yeah. just stop you there, Maggie? Because I, I know of a couple of brand names and can you identify mm. for us which ones there are? Now, in the supermarket, you see rat sack. And you see Talon. Are they the same active ingredients and is one better than the other uh, in a okay. domestic situation? Rat, rat sack isn't rat sack. <laughs> There's several different types of rat sack. So rat sack uh, double strength is the good guy. <gasps> That's okay. got warfarin. So you look for the word warfarin. That's the one you want. Normal rat sack has various chemicals like bromodialone or those are the bad guys. Those are the ones that stick around for hundreds of days in, in the animal or the dead animal. The other one, the brand name is the, you can't get it at the supermarkets, but you can get it at land agents and stuff. It's called Racumen. Racumen. That's the other really good one. So those are first generation ones. They're very effective, but they break down almost immediately. So those are the ones that we encourage domestic people to use and farmers 
where they can because they break down usually within 24 hours of being ingested. And so the secondary poisoning is much less. So can I just get it clear? They're the oldest of the chemical compounds. So they're the yeah. old ones. So what are the reasons that people are pushing the second generation ones? There's a mistaken belief that they work faster. So there was a lot of misinformation that came from the New South Wales agriculture minister who said it works within 24 hours. It works within an hour. Neither of those are correct. It takes three to seven days for the, that chemical to work. The reason why they were developed is because they stick around a lot longer. Okay. And let, I think most of us are, are, are pretty aware of how to do baiting in the home. But the thing, I, my housemate has got one of these humane, non-lethal traps. But he catches the mice in his shed he either lets them go or he has to kill them. How do you humanely kill uh, mice that you have caught in a way which is non-lethal? I mean, to me, <laughs> it, 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 it seems like Hobson's choice, isn't it? Well, I used to work in a pet store way, way back, and we had to feed mice to our snakes. And as part of the RSPCA oversight of this we were taught by rspca um not rspca aspca sorry it was in the u.s members that the best way to kill a mouse or a rat to stun them is you pick them up by the tail and you whap them down whack on them something on, really whack them on your desk okay whack so them just, on your desk just like um sylvester used to do to sweetie sweetie pie and jerry <laughs> okay and that, no it's not nice but it's quicker faster and less dangerous than trying to put them in like a tent with CO2 or the other more considered humane methods. I think there's a CO2 cartridge trap somewhere. Okay, so so that would be that they go into a chamber of some sort and then you you gas them. Yeah, that um it's you can buy them. I think they're prohibitively expensive though. But I guess the whole point, and, and this is what, what Holly needs to talk to you about, is no matter what lethal thing you choose to use, you need to make sure that you're not creating a bigger problem by having a mouse that's full of poison for 250 days that's just sitting there waiting for your pet dog to eat it or the bird that is scavenging. And that's the whole point, is, is finding that happy medium of how to kill mice and how not to kill everything else around it. Okay, so let before we move on with Holly, because that's how do we stop how do we stop the ingestion of the dead animals is going to be a, a a big thing. But let's just get the brands clear. If it's a broad yes. scale agricultural purpose, racumen is what you uh, recommend. Oh, agri oh, so agriculture, we're different. <laughs> okay, so, so are they different it, chemicals or just different brand names? I actually don't know what racumen is in the agricultural um, space. I think it's the same. Elders told me that it was the same name, but I haven't checked that up recently to make sure it is the same name. Do you know, Holly? Is it is racumen? I believe it's the same up. name, but it'll be the same active ingredient. It's the same active ingredient, yeah. which is the cutamatrol. Is the one Kuna, Kuna, Kuna so that is available for household and shed use as a little like square pack it and you yep. just toss it around in areas where your domestic dogs can't get to it because they still will eat it and it's still poisonous mm -hmm. but it's it when your mouse eats it or your rat eats it it goes into their into their digestive system and breaks down almost immediately yeah now racumen's also available as a paste so no that's yeah it comes in these little packets they're they're yep. they're pasty things in like a so that can't they do have an agricultural version of it that is used for broad scale spreading but the other broad scale one that's used in agriculture that you can't use in the house is zinc phosphide which is neither a first or second generation pesticide it's just a stuff it's just stuff <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just having a look now at um an old elders rural post from 2017 
and that's saying what it will bring up for control in rice fields. So what are they? What are they suggesting? Rotalon, which is a late late generation coagulant. The active ingredient in Rotalon is uh, diphenthiolone. So that's a second gen. That's a second gen. So yeah. no. Yeah. So basically, you're looking for your first generation rodenticides. So the two ingredients you're looking for are warfarin or coumatrol. I can never pronounce that one. Me neither. Um, they're, it's horrible. They're, they're the ones that if you have to bait, they're the ones to go for. And as Maggie said, in agricultural settings, there is also zinc phosphide, which is a rodenticide, but it's not an anticoagulant rodenticide. So it doesn't cause the rodents to bleed to death. It basically forms a phosphine gas in their stomach and it's very it needs to be done in open settings it's got a whole um, series of risks around them for people as well if those gases open up and you inhale them you're in big trouble as well so it's, it needs to be done in very strict settings in a broad-scale agricultural use it's definitely not anything for a shed a confined space around the home at all yeah. it's it tastes very sweet so sheep get into it and you can lose a whole flock and is it something that is going to be bad news for the scavengers and and our birds of prey? I think, yeah, like Maggie said, it's a bit hit and miss. I think we're particularly through the mouse plague in Western New South Wales where there have been problems with zinc phosphide this time around is where actually grain eating species have got into grain that has been laced with zinc phosphide. And so we, that's where we've seen reports of mascalar deaths and corellas and things as well. It's not mm-hmm. so much in birds of prey then, it's direct ingestion that's causing the problem. And, and, and that's poor storage. Yeah. I did see all the, the news coverage of the galahs and the corellas, but how about things like pigeons? Have, have you had any reports yeah, look, they will absolutely be have been impacted as well, the cresteds and things that are getting along spill sites. We've really struggled to get a handle on deaths, getting some information on what's been found. It's been really hard to get an official, some official data on what's been going on, but there have been those incidental reports that have come through, absolutely. So I'd suspect that there's actually a range of birds that have been impacted through zinc phosphide poisoning for sure. Okay, well, let's let's leave broad-scale agriculture aside for a moment. If you are needing to control rodents in your garden, your work shed and your kitchen, how do you do it? How do you place the materials and how do you ensure that the carcasses, corpses, are not ingested by pets or other wildlife? You only have two options, the rat sack with the warfarin in it, which is rat sack double strength, and racumin. Those are the only two options that do not have the chemicals that will be passed on uh, to your to your dog, to your kids, to the local wildlife. As far as placement is concerned, rat sack double strength, does it come with the... I've, I've never actually bought it. I think it comes in a little container. Yeah, bait box? It? Yeah. It might come it in a bait, in bait box. box. So the bait boxes are good, but you still have to be careful with of your dog. So you always put it behind or inside a pantry that the dog isn't going to get to. And yeah. the, the same with the rabbit. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Because they can get primary poisoning by eating it themselves. And then you have to go through the whole vitamin K pills for weeks and weeks to build up their ability to clot again. Do possums like rat sack? Yes, they do. Okay. Yep. So that's another secondary transfer. So this is not always – secondary poisoning in wildlife is not always necessarily the birds of prey or corvids or whatever, ravens and things, eating the dead or dying rats. It's working up the food chain from possums that are eating the bait directly or a powerful owl that's feeding on another bird that has eaten a rat. Or in the case of, we've seen it in Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles recently in a paper, where those birds are not eating the rats directly. They're, it's getting up into the food chain and knocking off wedgies. So it's, it's not just that direct ingestion of the rat that's the issue. It's getting through the food chain by things that are eating other things. And I'm guessing mm-hmm. macropods also will, mm-hmm. if they find it, they will eat it. 
quite possibly. I'm not, I can't say I've heard mm-hmm. of it, but I'm not. I haven't heard of that. Yeah, I don't know. I do know it's been, I mean, we're not talking about the two good guys. Or we're talking about the other bad guys. Um, it's been found in lizards in the Perth region. It's been found in insects that feed, so cockroaches and beetles and other insects that crawl into the bait boxes and eat the stuff it's themselves. It's been found in those insects. So that means if you're using the wrong poison, it can spread everywhere really fast. Even uh, Was it found in frogs in that one study? In, no, it was found in snakes. A frog snakes, eating snake. Same. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. So when these poisons get washed away in the surface water and end up in the in streams, then the frogs are eating the insects that are there, and then the snakes get the, the poison dose from the, eating the frogs. So it's. I'm guessing absorption through skin as well. I mean, I, I, I don't think you're encouraged to put your hand in, in a, a receptacle of pellets. And I imagine that mm. frogs are ingesting it through their skin if it's in the if it's in the environment. That that leads me to another question, and I don't know if if either of you will know this, but we know that it, it is poisoning some things. But what kind of monitoring is there? <laughs> uh, it, I mean. And I'm glad you're laughing because I'm suspecting the answer is zero. Is that pretty right? Like none of our regulatory bodies are out there sampling areas where there are plagues to see what is happening? My understanding is the EPA in New South Wales was asking for reports of more than five deaths on a property during the plague and then testing for identified presence in those. That is, is the only, I, I guess, consistent testing that I know that has been going on by state government. I think it, it's mostly sort of academics and, and things that are mm-hmm. looking at this and, and doing the sampling. It's Maggie, it's Rob Davis and Michael Orr in WA really pushing this issue for sure. So, yeah, we're trying to get protocols through the Wildlife Disease Association so that uh, vets who end up with these carcasses know what to do with them and so we can start some sort of monitoring to to see what's happening with all of these rodenticides that are being dumped into the uh, environment let me throw another curveball to you let's say <laughs> somebody has you has been using in a broad scale application second gen poisons an authority or some kind some well-meaning person collects what? How? How can they be responsibly disposed of? Not the chemical, the corpses. Okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Isn't it? So the, the ABC asked you that, did they? Well, the, the stockpiling of chemicals is an issue we know because there are stockpiles of bromodialone now. The New South Wales right. government bought a whole bunch of it, and. And then weren't allowed to use it. And then they weren't allowed to use it. So it's just sitting in a shed, many sheds, somewhere. and Wait, Waiting to catch fire. Well, waiting to be dispersed. So if something eats the, one of the second generation poisons, you need to collect those corpses and they need to be interred under the ground, six feet under or whatever, for at least 300 days. Okay, so no incineration? Be sure that's not going to release something nasty. Yeah. yeah, so it's digging a trench, basically, if you've got a lot if you've got a lot of corpses, because we're talking about mass kill events, aren't we? We're not talking about, I mean, in, at, here at home, I might have seven to ten mm. mice running around. But if you're using it in a broad-scale sense and the wrong chemical is used, you're likely to have hundreds. Thousands. Corpses. So that's where I'm just wondering, what does someone do if they know they've done the wrong thing, but they now have this residual problem of dead animals? I'm wondering about zinc phosphide. If you burn them, I think that might be dangerous. That would release the gas and that would be, yeah, that would be pretty that'd, toxic for sure. That'd be so, wouldn't it? But bromodialone melts at... 172 degrees Celsius, thermally stable below 150 degrees Celsius. 
flash point 218 degrees Celsius. So depends on how hot your fire is. You could have an explosion. So, so you want to bury them. That's I think burying is probably the same. So the same way you'd treat a couple of dead sheep. You would get your backhoe out and you would mm. dig a hole. Make a big trench. Gonna, and it's going to have to be deeper than any dogs or wildlife can get into. And that, and you've got to make sure that it's not in any groundwater way because those chemicals will leach out. So the answer is don't use those poisons. That's really the answer. It's pretty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So EPA has uh, a PDF on guidance of handling and disposing dead mice. So they say preferred disposal options are via red bin waste collection or on-site burial. They do suggest, they do say open air burning, but subject to required approvals and in rural areas Mm. with no service. So they're the three ways that they suggest. But And there's a whole section in this on on on-farm burials and what to consider. So there's got to be two metres between the water table and the base of the pit. 200 metres from surface water, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so a whole... Um, decay yeah. time in soils for bromodile alone, half-life in soil ranges, sorry, half-life in soil ranges from 1.8 to 23 days, depending on conditions. Um, not readily leached into soils containing organic matter, so not expected to contaminate water supply and aquifers. So that's good. Mm. That is good. And, that, yeah. and Holly, you were referencing the EPA, that's EPA. New, New South Wales, yes. So, so for other states, you're going to need to check and see what the regs are. I'm surprised that red bin disposal mm. is, is mm. okay. It seems to be something about convenience rather than I, being sure that it is not yeah. contaminating other bodies. Yeah, for sure. And I can imagine for anybody in a typical urban setting, that's gonna that's the way you dispose of dead things. You might put them in a plastic bag and, and turf them in the bin. And, and I think it's I think there's a massive education issue here that people believe because these products are so readily available on the shelves. Well, I mean, admittedly, I struggled to find a lot of these products during plague season, even though I'm not in a plague area, because I think the word got out that there are mice everywhere, so everybody bought up um, all all the rodenticides, um, and the shelves were really bare, and so I think it probably goes into this sort of mass then concern and buying like hoarding of toilet paper. Everybody was hoarding <laughs> rodenticide products. They were. <laughs> For sure. Uh, this morning when I went out to get my coffee and support my local purveyor of caffeine, I went to the supermarket and I was in the aisle with my camera about to take a picture mm-hmm. of the shelf and a employee of said supermarket tapped me on the shoulder and said, no. So That's a bit weird. It is a bit weird, but there's obviously a sensitivity because, of course, you're in that bay with the, the stuff, the chemicals, the the garden chemicals and whatnot. So, yeah, I didn't labour the point and I didn't go back and take my hat off or whatever and go and do it again. <laughs> I, just, I just thought it was interesting. And uh, in a former life, I worked for a garden company and sold those chemicals and placed them into supermarkets and whatnot. And even though we did have the safety data sheets, we were never trained as part of the company about which were good and which were bad. And that's where I want to go next. But is there anything anything more that really needs to be said about choosing and using rodenticides that we haven't already smoothed well, over? Bird Life Australia has that lovely page that says... Yeah. So we've got a, a, a page, it's actforbirds.org forward slash rat poison, where you can get all sorts of information. It's got the chemicals to go for if you do um, want to be, if you do need to bait. And I guess in a typical garden household setting, leaving rural plague situations aside, I guess you need to basically assess whether you need to bait at all. So... How substantial is the issue that you've got? What are the steps that you can take before you get rodents around the place? So is there, if you've got 
chooks like I do, it pretty much guarantees that you're going to have some mice and rats getting around. But, you know, trying to go with no spill containers, if you've got, if you're feeding pets outside, likewise, making sure everything's nice and sealed up, that you're minimizing opportunities for, for rodents around your place. If you've got palms, keeping them relatively tidy and things because rats seem to love getting in amongst them. So, so making sure that you're keeping things relatively clean around the place. So you're minimizing the chance that you've got the infestation to begin with. And then if you do find that you've got rats and mice around the place and you need to get rid of them, nobody wants them hanging around and they can be a health risk as well. So there's no problem with dealing with the issue. It's considering what your best options are. So do you have to bait? Go with some snap traps. I, I think that, that people probably go with for the bait option for the very option reason that we don't want the baits used in that the rodents go away and die somewhere else. And so you don't have to deal with a dead carcass. It's not fun. But unfortunately, because of the vast majority of the, the products on the shelves of those second-gen rodenticides, the fact that these rodents are going away and dying somewhere else is a massive problem. That's exactly it. So even putting them in a roof cavity, putting your baits in a roof cavity, great. It means the dogs and things can't get access. But if you're using a second-generation rodenticide, the rats are going to eat the bait and then they are going to go off somewhere else. They're not going to stay within the cavity for the most part and die there. They're going to be venturing out into the garden and whatnot and be found somewhere else. So looking at, at snap traps as, a, as another option, if you do need to bait because you've got quite a large infestation that you need to deal with, then like we've been talking about all session, it's those first generation rodenticides. It's the warfarin and the kumatrimol that I can never pronounce that one. <laughs> Those are the active ingredients to look for. But still, as Maggie said, making sure that you're keeping the products away from dogs and kids. They are still rodenticides. They are still highly toxic. It just has less of a chance of ending up in, in amongst wildlife as a second gen, as a, a secondary poisoning event. And but have I got that? Can you see the ticker yes. that I've got going? Yep, got that's that it. Right? So you can go to that <laughs> and then there'll There'll be a, a rat poison page. There's all sorts of information. There's some of the research that we've got going on. There's a, a downloadable brochure. You can advertise that you've got an owl-friendly garden because you're not using those products. There's all sorts of stuff there for the people to check out. Fantastic. I'm just going to edit that because I've just I just grabbed. Oh, come on. <laughs> there we are. Hopeless. While I'm doing while I'm doing that, we hadn't really talked about this, but. I'd like to talk about some of the other pest control that people might need to use in a garden or domestic situation. Are we okay to venture into snails and rabbits and foxes, things like that? What the preferred preferred methods should be or the preferred compounds? Sure. I I admit that that some of it's not my area, but I can do my best. We know is the chemical that's most rodent or the anticoagulant that's mostly used for rabbits, and it has chances of secondary poisoning as well. So you know, any of those things can be an issue. I guess with any chemical that you're putting out in the garden, you want to do some research on what the active ingredient is and avoiding them where possible because snails and slugs are not fun to have around the garden, especially if you've got a veggie patch, but they're great food for blue tongue lizards and other and birds and things as well. So you want to be trying to create a garden where the wildlife can do the pest management for you rather than you needing to add anything in particular to it. So I would always look at anything to control those, especially invertebrates, so insects and things, as a last resort because they are such vital members of the, the web of life within a garden that there will be something coming to feed on them. So putting in anything chemical to control them as a last resort. Now, the old the old favourite, snails and slugs. What? The, those what? pellets are incredibly dangerous for dogs and mm -hmm. opossums. They just, you might as well be putting out the poison for, I, honestly, I don't know why they're even available. That's really the issue, isn't it? That, I mean, having been someone who, you know, trained as a horticulturist and was selling for a long time, both 
in a in my own nursery and working for others it's just bad these things are just bad um yeah it's metal de- me- me- metaldehyde that's it <laughs> I can say it metaldehyde but there's so many other things which we are learning a lot later are just bad in out there in the environment glyphosate we mm. don't know is something that you don't want on your skin at all. I remember when Confidor, which I think is a nicotinoid, I think, pest control, which was a systemic. Mm -hmm. Now, I was working, excuse me, for the company that was selling it in Australia when it was released in a beautiful green trigger pack. And it was marketed as the least worst kind of well, the the sellers of glyphosate they used to they drink it they'd say it's so safe you can drink it so uh, yeah there's a land agent i know who was telling me these stories back in the 80s they'd be like oh yeah so safe you can drink it oh, well, when, <laughs> how'd that work out for them <laughs> yeah when i was working in in horticulture in maintenance horticulture and also production horticulture if we were using fungicides we would kit right up the suit the the tissue suit then the plastic waterproof suit the visor the breathing apparatus but never when we were using glyphosate i mean glyphosate you'd wear maybe gloves maybe some goggles but not the full rest no no you'd be striding around in your thongs (laughs) and also all the kind of old the old remedies, copper sulfate and all those kind of things for your fruit trees. And what we were just very careless about things. And, and I must say, even though I've been a bird lover since I was a kid, I didn't give any of these issues very mm-hmm. deep thought when I was working in that in- industry because you just get sucked into it, which I guess is why. It's the marketing which is why we're talking about it now. Yeah. And I'll talk about it until the day I die about what people are using and doing, even if it is less harmful. It's, it's all it's, about money. It, well, it, even if you can use the friendliest product possible, it's still better to, do, to not use any. It's better to use some other form of intervention if you can. Mm. Especially um, if you're around the home, there's generally um, a, a really safe, alternative send your kid out with a bucket to gather up some snails and have a bit of fun there's ways to manage these issues for the most part ducks get some ducks get some ducks that'll get rid of your snail problem real quick what maggie again we haven't prepared for this we haven't talked about it before but but what what are the what are some of the really bad compounds that are commonly available for say horticultural use that you would say to people, just totally avoid? Well, I don't know if you remember Peter Kundle. From, I do uh, remember Peter Kundle, yes. the fantastic uh, Tasmanian ABC gardener. Oh, I, I, I love the man. He was a hero of mine. Every Everything that I learned about gardening, I learned from him. So as a gardener, it's basically... If you can't pick it off by yourself, then you grab the bad guy and you crush it up and you spray it on there to make <laughs> things go away. You cultivate the the insects that will eat the insects that you're trying to deal with. Fungus, there's always some other alternative. So I'd, and I'd pretty much say don't use any chemicals at all in, in your garden um, because it's just not worth the risk. We just don't have enough information in terms of the risk of any chemical that's available, mostly because a lot of these are used. Uh, sorry, I was just reading the thing. A lot of these are used are, are, are chemicals that were developed so long ago before we had the, the data sheets, before we even investigated it. It's just stuff that you used from the 1940s and it works. It's a bit like aspirin. So if someone discovered aspirin today and tried to get it registered as a drug, it would never make it because it's so dangerous. Tess, welcome aboard. Thanks for your comment. I, ne- I nearly chuckled when we're talking about dead things in the local cemetery. Pindone <laughs> being used in local cemetery to take out rabbits. Mm-hmm. So crazy. the carrot lacing thing is a big, has been a big problem in this area here. I'm in Albury region. 
So in the 70s and 80s, a huge carrot lacing pro- program was done. And there are farms still today that don't have any possums left because they were all killed by Pindam. Well, I, uh, just struggling <laughs> for words a bit. Because I wonder why that is a method that is preferred for rabbits. It, it, is it just because of the cost of mechanical control, ripping or collapsing burrow warrens and whatnot? Is the pellets into warrens a better control measure than than poisoning with pindone and, and laying baits for them is do we have a do we have a view on rabbit control I think Khaleesi I, works really well oh look I don't think I can really speak for land managers that that decide to employ that method I would suggest that it probably is a more cost effective mm. um, tool because you can put them out and, and walk away you don't have to be out there for hours with heavy machinery and, and things. And somewhere in an urban setting like that, it's probably not possible to, to get the machinery and things in or you can't do sh- you can't do shooting or anything like that in those sort of settings. So it's probably a combination of the cost and the time to, to deploy baits versus other methods as well as the restrictions when you're working in an urban setting of what you can actually ground do, I would suggest. But yes, the secondary poisoning is a huge risk in, yep. in using pin down. And yes, the blue tongues, possums. Well, I'd, I'd even probably push it a bit further. My neighbours throw their leftover dinner in the park. I throw out seed. My neighbours throw out noodles. And yep, they also throw out vegetables. And the local cockatoos love yep. them. So I certainly wouldn't like to be seeing people throwing out carrots into areas where galahs and cockatoos might be hanging out. And I imagine if the pieces are small enough, your carawongs and crows are all going to get get into it, ravens and whatnot yep. too. So, yeah. I mean, look, it, it's a vexed problem, isn't it? Because we don't want the pest. But sometimes a, a rabbit's in a cemetery really that bad? I mean, Well, it's because they're European rabbits. So European rabbits burrow. And they make warrens. If they, if the forefathers had brought in American rabbits who don't do that, then you wouldn't be having this discussion. <laughs> well, that, well, let's go to another monumental disaster mistake: foxes. <laughs> so the Victorian Acclimatization Society has a lot, a lot to, to answer, answer for. <laughs> Blackberries, w- w- weeping willows, uh, foxes. I think they introduced monkeys to one area. Yeah, like- well, blackbirds, of course. We've got our sparrows. I mean, don't, sparrows. don't, leave, don't leave the sparrows out. And, and look, I'm, I'm far less of a, of a hater on the introduced birds than I used to be when I was younger. And, in fact, I did see someone's post on Twitter that, that Mr. Dooley commented on about the song thrush. I quite like the song thrush. But I'd much Probably, rather... But there's have, only a handful of them left, so... Well, that's right. <laughs> but I'd much rather have the ground thrush hanging around <laughs> than the song thrush and the blackbird. I'd like some whistlers, please, over here. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I, I mean, we don't even have yellow robins here. So, um, so foxes, What if somebody needs to get into fox control... Now, I only know of fox off. What can you tell me about that, Maggie? So, there's two ways of getting well three i guess three ways of getting rid of a fox one you you kill it with a bait uh, like a 1080 or whatever thing which is problematic in some ways because it's not the nicest death on the planet the uh, uh, what's he what's he what's he (laughs) it's quick so so if we're talking about humane we we were talking about quick death so sharpshooter they they very rarely miss i've seen pig shooters go after cats Mm. and you know, they, they can take out 20 feral cats from a helicopter and it's it's the most amazing thing to see. Anyway, so sh- sharp shooting really isn't an option. In a, mor- in a morbid kind of way. In, <laughs> in a, a morbid kind of way. Yeah, in a morbid, awful kind of way. Yeah, but you are cleaning um, up the environment. So the other one, so Fox Off is 1080. On the one hand, it's not bad because it is derived from natural chemicals. It breaks down easily. But on the other hand, it's not a nice death and you always risk domestic dogs getting into it. There is a chemical that 
was developed on Phillip Island that I still haven't seen used widely that is an abortifactant. So an abortifactant, it's a canine abortifactant. So you, the, it's like, a, it's put in a bait, the animal eats it. And if they happen to be a canine, like a fox or a dog, then they all their pups abort. And so you kill by attrition and it takes several generations. And so that's an option to use in areas where high risk areas of, of secondary poisoning for, um, for domestic dogs, because Otherwise, I mean, you just have to put signs out as as well saying, if your dog eats this bait and it's a breeding dog, then you're in trouble. You're going to lose your pups. But that's easier than 1080. Okay. I've just uh, done a search on Phillip Island for foxes and yeah, I'm not seeing anything there, just den fumigation. Now, I'm, ima- I'm imagining that den fumigation is is problematic as well mm-hmm. for those, those chemicals, I would say. Do you know what that would be? No, I don't know what that one is, what they use there. I'm trying to Here find the abortifactant that they... I'm going to Pest Smart. That might have some more info on that. That's the Centre for Invasive Species, so that might have... Yeah, the knockdown cleanup. So that is three, three ways... No, not seeing the, the abortion method there. So I'm looking on the so be que- very limited. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, Chemical the abortifactant. Here we go. Cabergoline. C A B E R G O L I N E. C A B E G O L I N E. That's selective. That's selective just for canines. So, <laughs> so cats aren't aren't at risk. Correct. Okay. I'm imagining that's a very strictly controlled chemical so that you probably can't rock on down the mm. shoulders or you can't do it. But it's, it needs to be used in conjunction with other forms of control because otherwise you're always getting new vixens coming into the area. So you basically, when you, so an island is really a good place to do that because you can shoot out as many as you can, and then you lay out the abort- the chemical abortifactant, and then that kind of cleans up any else, and then and you can restrict. So on, on Phillip Island, they've gotten to the point now where they just have one officer who's got dogs who combs the island every few weeks with dogs that have been trained to hunt out foxes to make sure that none get across the island, the San Remo Bridge. Yeah, here we go. Tess has is, is, uh, given us another comment. What's she got? <laughs> oh look, she's even said something nice. So we've like realised her worst fears. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's when you start thinking about all the chemicals that we use, then you're just like, what are we doing? I think the the principles that that I was taught when I studied horticulture are the things we need to always bear in mind. I think, and that's the principles of integrated pest management. There is no silver bullet, and Nothing is easy, and if you can use the the principles of tread lightly in any decision that you that you make, yeah. So sorry, Tess has uh, Tess has just given me another message there. I think we definitely did say your worst fear. <laughs> I wasn't meaning to say that you thought it was good that we were well, here. I've, facing I've I've just read about the fumigation technique in the dens, and that's carbon dioxide. So that's not bad, but. The problem happens that you don't, because the den isn't just one room, it's like yeah. fingers, there's lots of fingers and, yeah. and it's all airtight. So you end up, you can end up with pockets of air and it doesn't work. So it's a lot of work for mm-hmm. not much gain. No, I mean, well, fox eradication is very difficult. Otherwise, we probably would have eradicated foxes in the 70s mm-hmm. when all the mm-hmm. governments were getting together and trying to do it. And don't forget, there's the um, Sydney Fox Rescue Society that yeah. we have to deal with. Well, yeah, don't get me started. I mean, look at all the money that's going into saving dogs in Bali. I mean, for crying out loud, <laughs> can you put some of it into the bloody region honey eater or something if you don't mind? Yeah, oh, look, everyone, it, it's just, yeah, 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 I just, we got some pretty serious problems here. I'd like the Indonesians to look after Indonesia and, yeah. And I, don't get me wrong, I speak Indonesian and I love Indonesia, but 
you know, please, can we do something about the helmeted honey eater? Actually, Holly, let me go <gasps> completely <gasps> off script. The helmeted honey eater isn't a species. No, it's a it isn't. It's oh, the it's end a of race. a climb. It's the end of a climb. It doesn't. Have... <laughs> this is the evolutionary biologist of okay, me speaking. Okay. No, no, because, because this is one of those things where the issue about where resources should go is really, really important. Now, sometimes I say, should we even bother saving a species? Now, that's not my, that's not a point I put out. I, mm-hmm. I, I'm saying I agree with. But when is it important to to save something? <laughs> and the helmet and honey eater. Maggie, go. This is controversy. I like it. It is. It is. It is very. So if you look at the yellow yeah, tufted honey. honey yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the map of the yellow tufted honey eater, it starts up north and the, the range comes all the way south and ends up in this in Victoria. And if you look at the size of the tuft, it follows this rule of of what we call a cline. And it's a spatial gradient in a specific singular trait. So if you look at the yellow tufted honey eater in its northern part of its range and you put it next to the, the helmeted honey eater you put them next to each other you would go oh well they're definitely a different species because they're so different but the fact is that they're they exchange genetic material along that whole climb and so you're just seeing one trait that's exaggerated but it actually isn't any different than that one that's way up north and so from an evolutionary point of view, you're not actually losing genetic diversity by letting the less tufty ones subsume the, the, the helmeted honey eater. But that's taking the long lineage look that doesn't necessarily sit very well with Victoria. It's one of those interesting things. And sorry if you're, if you're watching just for pesticide stuff (laughs) don't get me started (laughs) it's one of these decisions that people have to make and i know it's drawing a long bow but if you're a open space manager what you use for pest control or weed control geez weeds that's next (laughs) is a decision that you have has so many different factors that can affect it i want to hear what you think about this holly which population worth worth putting energy into saving? Oh wow, yeah. Oh, that's that's a massive philosophical, ethical, financial. Everything is wrapped up in that decision, and 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 I don't think that there is one easy solution. It can depend on whereabouts you sit on the spectrum of, of your feelings on the ethics of saving everything, and knowing that's not actually. Unfortunately, possible. possible. I guess you need to, as a, a land manager or running a program or, or deciding on what birds or other wildlife to save, you know, is, is going to always be influenced by the people involved. I, mm. I don't think it can ever be a clinical right answer for, for this. We are always going to be influenced by people's emotions and that is ultimately going to drive decision-making Unfortunately, I don't think you can get you can't get away from people's hearts in these sorts of decisions, and that can be a really good thing and it can be a really hard thing as well. And so, I guess that's one of the reasons I love my job in urban birds is not because I don't have to make those hard decisions because threatened species use urban spaces, but I'm not dealing with some of the regent honey eaters and orange bellied parrots and things that are in really dire straits. But Yep. But I think there is great value in interventions before things get to that point. And so I'm often talking about keeping common birds common and not dealing with hyper abundant problem species. But we we want to, wherever we can, not be getting to the point where you are down to that critical decision making and things are in incredible dire straits and you're starting to look at whether it is actually viable to save a population um, or a species as a whole. Those interventions need to be made way before that really hard decision needs to be made and 
that's not even one decision that's influenced by the financial the the, the grant funding that's available and the staff that are, are available and who the landholders are there's it's an incredibly complex system but i think yeah i think that's one of the reasons I think that working in urban birds and conserving things in gardens is so important because it's keeping things common and it's keeping people connected. And we can't expect people to care about and be passionate about, in in the grand scheme of things, some of these little brown birds that live well, somewhere well, else. They because- don't care about them. Yeah, if they don't care about the things that are around them, that's their first interaction with birds and with nature in a lot of cases, especially as we're in so many of us are in lockdown. That's our interaction and that's our connection to nature and that's really, really vital to keep maintaining. And so where issues like red endicide become really important as well because this is, like you said, Grant, this is not something that a lot of people think about because these products are available on the mm. shelf to deal with a problem. And, that's and so... Lean in to Tess's comment, which I did want to comment on, having been, hey, Tess, I'm an ex-Bunnings buddy too. That was, yeah, a very, very interesting management style of Bunnings. So um, one th- maybe you can answer this, Mr. Bunnings. So in, in the US, we have this invasive ant called a fire ant. Yep. That came up. Yeah, unfortunately. The, the great entomologist E.O. Wilson discovered it when he was like 11 years old in Texas and wrote his first paper, I think, at 12. Anyway, so one of the, the best ways to control fire ants in your yard is something called borax. So yep. borax is this chemical that we use to... You can buy it in the laundry... Everywhere. You can buy it yep. in the laundry aisle because it, yep. it makes things happen in your washing machine. It's really hard to get borax here in Australia. Why? It's perfect for ants. It doesn't do anything bad. All it does is make them blow up. (laughs) It's not a chemical that kills them. It just makes them blow up. I don't know the actual answer, but I have a supposition. And that is borax is slash was cheap. So... Why sell borax at a dollar fifty for five hundred grams if you can sell someone something for seventeen dollars in a shiny, lovely trigger pack? I think that's the answer. Dang. And Tessa's comment is spot on. If I could recommend to someone an easy mechanical or intervention to solve a problem, most customers wanted me to put one or two trigger packs in their hands. And that's exactly what Tessa said. Chemicals are what everyone wants, even for (sighs) ants at the letterbox. And, yep, having worked there and having worked for a major company selling potting mix and fertilisers and pest control and supplements and whatnot, that's it. There's a huge apparatus behind it, but every consumer wants to walk in and walk out with a solution in a mm-hmm. plastic trigger pack or in a bag. So, so you're saying we need to do societal it. change? Well, <sighs> well, Easy. well, people still don't have comp- compost heaps mm-hmm. and worm farms in every backyard. So, so. All those potato peelings are still going into landfill and still releasing methane and whatnot as they break down. We have not been able to counter the commercial interests in doing Mm. sweet FA. And I think that... And that must be why bromodialone is sitting in those Mm -hmm. silos somewhere in New South Wales because there must have been more money in bromodialone for somebody than the zinc phosphide, which had been already approved through the CSIRO work. There was a sales rep somewhere banking on next year's holiday from that commission. That, mm. at that, I mean, that's a whole different issue about how things are sold and how people are rewarded for selling products. But unfortunately, you can't separate the con- consumer behaviour and also the profit of the suppliers and distributors. So it's we're never going to solve the issue until 
Well, it's the big thing for me is that you can't do everything but do something. So, so if you haven't got a compost heap, start one. Peter Cundall, go back and look at all of the ABC gardening how-tos. Um, he was and, the best. And if you do have a compost heap that works, great. If you have one that doesn't, work out how to make it work. It's not too difficult. And if you have a compost heap and you don't have a worm farm, get a worm farm. Yeah. If you can have chickens, we can't have chickens here, unfortunately, but we're allowed to have one, I think. Socially horrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, because so many people around here have had roosters and there was a fighting mm. cocks and all that. I think my municipality just says don't have any. I don't think we're allowed to have ducks, but I used to have ducks when I was a kid. And when you got ducks, you don't have snails and slugs. You just don't have them. Harlequin bugs. I mean, controlling insects and controlling weeds, are there really bad chemicals, Maggie, that we just that just should not be in anybody's household for these two? Harlequin bugs, let's say. Oh, let's say insects generally. You've got, harlequin bugs are one that in some parts of Melbourne are really difficult. I don't think they do that much trouble, but problem, people just don't like them. They're stinky. Um, so you've got the pyrethrum sprays, which are fine. Those are, pyrethrum is based off of marigolds? Uh, sorry, a lot of Asteraceae family plants have the pyrethrum. Pyrethroid, pyrethromoides, yes. or whatever they are. So, yeah. Anything that's got that sort of chemical in it is usually fine. Let's see. Rotenone is the other one. And that one, odorless, colorless crystal, broad spectrum, occurs naturally in the seeds of some plants, interfering with electron transport chain. Oh, that sounds good. That, that sounds good. We should be able to market that. It, moderately <laughs> hazardous, oh, extremely toxic to fish and insects. Oh, no, let's not use that. So, yeah. Uh, at what you're looking at now, are there any brand names there that, to be avoided? Ooh, might cause Parkinson's disease. Nice. Yeah, no, that's. that's so, Rotenone. No. Uh, Daris Dust. Oh, der yeah, Daris Dust. We used to use that on the cabbages for the cabbage white. Mm, don't. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of all the names of the stuff I used to sell. Daris Dust was out there. Carbaryl. Of course, you had Confidor. All that aphid, aphids stuff. Really There's always nasty. an organic way of dealing yeah, with these yeah, things. Yeah, There's yeah. always another method. Really nasty systemic things. And was another one. I remember working in ground parks and gardens, grounds management. We used to use this thing called paraquat, which is just shocking. But they're still using it. That's paraquat was selective, I think, for for. I've got to get this right. I think it was selective for for monocots, not dicots. Oh yeah, yeah. Um... Man, oh, horrible stuff. I think uh, I might have I might have it the wrong way around, but I think to, that was what we used to control, like onion weed and whatnot. And I can't remember what we used. For highly it. toxic to mammals, yeah. acute oh, respiratory distress. Stuff. Mechanical intervention with weeds is certainly the way to go, isn't it? And compost. And that's a one thing that we haven't really talked about is the other ways of controlling mouse plagues. Let's talk about that. I managed to take <laughs> us all the way around the block. So the CSIRO came out with years ago a um, how-to guide, and I haven't been able to track it down. I found it once and it's disappeared into the internet ether. And they had this whole list of things that they had tested of, of basically, here's how you, first of all, you see if there's going to be a mouse plague happening. So they've got these like chew cards that you can like scatter oh, around your, your how field. Many, how many you've yeah. got. Yes. Yeah, see how many you've got, and then you can run these like simple calculations of, okay, well, now I've got to do an intervention. But some of the other ones are really cool. So low-till or no-till farming is actually really bad because it leaves the mouse dens uh, in place. So if you've got an infestation, then you go and you deep-till your land because that then just messes up all the nesting. And farmers need to be start looking at that now because we're having an early spring, which means that normally breeding starts in September, but it's probably going to start in late August this year. 
Um, and the other one that uh, was really cool is something called a decoy crop. So the thing that triggers mice to go plague has to do with the quality of the diet that they're eating. So you've got this whiz-bang wheat product that's got a bajillion bits of fat in all of those seeds, and that's the really high-quality stuff that's going to make you a lot of money. And so you plant your whole um, farm out in this stuff. The mice are like, oh, this is really good. Oh, it's got a lot of fat. Oh, I'm going to plague. And they start plaguing, plaguing, and plaguing. But mice don't go very far. So if you plant a ring of really low-quality crap food, in one swathe of your machine around your whole crop, the mice don't go past that. They're like, oh, it's crap. I guess we'll not plague this year. And yeah. into this neighborhood. Oh, I'm not going over there. This not, it's not worth my while. And so then you don't. And so if, yes, you lose as a farmer, you lose the that amount of your field or your, your paddock. You don't have the cost. In, in but the, yeah, the surely against the cost of yeah, surely, the, the surely redenticides and the... Yeah, you come yeah. out ahead for sure. I think that the CSIRO did that in the 70s or 80s. They did some field trials, and in, it's not 100%. Nothing's 100%. So, but. so, what, so one slasher width or, or, or one cultivator width is actually enough to deter the movement. Is it? Yeah, so two two is better, but, you know, it's like a cost-benefit analysis sort of thing. Are you willing to lose that? How many slashers width are you willing to lose to save the, the crop on the inside? That's something I hadn't heard of. I, I'm really surprised that such a small distance is enough to deter the movement of our little friendly rodents. And- so a, mo- a mouse won't move more than 100 metres in its entire life. Again, Maggie, I, I'm, I'm probably stretching the, the bounds of friendship. Here it's not, I know it's not really your, your area, but but do you know if our native um, species that occupy the same niche as the house mouse, do you know if they are similarly geographically challenged, shall we say? So... Yes, and there is anecdotal information that they used to plague like the house mouse did until they were overcome by the the new invader. So, yes, there's a lot of mammals that are very limited. And so Holly was talking about keeping common species common, and that's something that we've been talking about um, for years now is you're you're doing all this reveg and and it, it, you build it and you expect them to come and that's fine for birds mm. who might be able to cross that matrix of other stuff but if you want to keep common species common you're going to have to do some targeted relocation the marsupial mice lizards that aren't going to cross uh, that 1k distance because they just don't and and you, you do need to think about it then um, about that sort of thing. So yes, there's a lot of species that are that are not vagile. Uh, that's the technical term for it. They just don't move very well across a matrix. Just freestyling. That's how we roll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <I'm> a <laughs> I think I need some coffee. <laughs> Why do you think it is that? Well, I was I was a kid concerned about all this stuff in the seventies, and and the early 80s all these issues were being talked about then why is it that we still when people build new roads and stuff like that why don't we have a wildlife underpass a corridor or an overpass or or whatnot you don't live in brisbane no well i know we've got the koala things in some particular locations but why is it that Every major road redevelopment, subdivision, whatever, does not have just as the same as you're going to run pipes down your drains and and in your services. Why is every road, every path not able to be safely traversed by lizards and you're going to put up a dollar sign. I can tell. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we know that is yes. the we know that's the answer. But I, I mean, there, a, there's a, it, a length. You're in the wrong pipe, country. You're in the wrong country. Pipe costs eleven dollars retail. It just astounds me that you can sell a blue tongue lizard in a pet shop mm. for what twenty bucks, thirty bucks, but 
we don't ascribe the value to that thing in the bush to be able to travel across a road. So there's a lot there's a lot of research that's been done in this space, especially for reptiles, because a reptile doesn't view the environment the same way that that you do. And so they've trialed different uh, passageways for turtles, especially because a lot of turtles won't enter in an underpass if it's got too much shadow, etc. And so they, they do a lot of this in the U.S. and Florida and the southern states because of the, the roads that traverse swamps. And then, so they found, and on the East Coast, they've found a certain shape will allow turtles to go underneath. In, in Spain, they're very concerned about their lizards, and so they build overpasses. And in Brisbane, they've got that amazing one that is, it, it just looks like a forest over the road. And birds use it, and lizards use it, and snakes use it, and, and but it's just so new. And who's going to pay for it? Well, the developer. I mean... But that means that the environmental impact statement has to have it in there. That's uh, a mitigation. But nobody knows about it. It just astounds me that we have news items just about every night. House prices in Melbourne, record prices, and it's always good news for homeowners, right? It's terrible. It doesn't matter which side of the coin you look at it. It's good news for one sector. It's bad news for another. No. Prices go up. I mean, surely we could factor in wildlife by now. This is what I get frustrated on and I bore my friends silly because I'm always crapping on about why. Well, you, you've got to you find the ear. You've got to find yeah. the ear of the environment minister, of the federal environment minister. You've got to find that person's minders. And you've got to. Cares. So I met her a couple of weeks ago. She's, and she's apparently a lovely lady. She just doesn't do anything. The last environment. But, but the, we well, the West Australian lady. So the minder told me that the website of the environment minister, there's a, a, a box of send, it, send me um, a question or whatever. If yeah. you say, I'm Holly Parsons, I'm in BirdLife Australia. Here's what you need to know about rodents, rodenticides, and you do a dot point as though you were briefing the minister herself, then she gets it. So it's, okay, here's a specific road and here's a specific way to do a mitigation strategy that will help this animal build an overpass, build an underpass. Here's a link to a paper that has done it in Spain. Thank you. Good night. Okay. So, so cause, cause I don't, I don't want to be part of the problem. I don't want to mm. be. I don't, I don't want to be the bloke on the sidelines, carping and carping. I I want to communicate the solutions to whoever needs to hear them. Yeah. The problem. The, the problem that I find. I'll give you an example. I've reached out to a couple of the zoos about some mm. of the recent captive breeding and translocation. Now they won't talk to me. Now, now. That's now, not unusual. <laughs> But this, but this is a problem. It's because they're part funded by government and they want to control the message that goes out. I turn it around and say, hey, you are part funded by government. Your stuff isn't state secrets. If what you didn't work, people should know about it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't reflect badly on Taronga Zoo or Melbourne Zoo if you had a go. But the community should know what works, what doesn't work, where the bang for bucks is going, rather than the best PR job gets funded. And that's my sort of problem with it. How do mm. I find how do I find the information to then go through the minister's press secretary and all that kind of stuff? Because I tried very hard to make contact with the minister's office and invite her on the show. They don't, they don't really, I doubt whether the messages mm. that they took have gone anywhere other than the round receptacle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not genuine. And that's why I roll my eyes and shrug my shoulders. There's no good faith 
Holly, you might remember. I'm not sure, Maggie, if you do, but remember we had once we had a Liberal Environment Minister who went and waged war basically at the International Whaling Commission. I think that's the last time we had a Conservative Environment Minister with a backbone. But Keen. Yeah, but but he but he just took twenty five percent out of saving our species. So so yeah, Matt, Matt Keen. But he, he, but he, he's doing some things. But on the other hand, he's a performance artist. That, that's yes. My problem. So it, 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 you don't go. Here's new national park, but I've taken twenty five percent of the money that that goes to saving the rare animals and plants in that national park. Here, have a national park. We're not going to save, or we're not going to continue to to put the same effort into preserving the endangered and threatened species that we've already spent ten years identifying and working out how to manage. That's performance art for me. Mm. So yeah, Matt Keane. I again, I've I've invited through his office to talk to me. No response, but. I don't want it. I don't want any of these people to be villains because they've all got the power to make change. Mm-hmm. So just make change, please. Um, I don't care what badge you wear, whether it's a red one or a blue one or a bloody do something, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's incredibly frustrating. I don't know. And hey, I'm just Joe. I'm just Joe Public. I mean, for you guys who have your careers based on all these issues and you've got to fight each other to get bloody 5,000 bucks. It's insane. That That's why the, the developers need to pay. That's my view. The developers need to pay because that's where the profit is. Sure. So there is University of Melbourne. I think I sent you guys the link just there. So University of Melbourne, so Sarah Beckersey oh, and yeah. Georgia Garrard have been doing a lot of work on biodiversity sensitive urban design and have developed this framework for how to go about actually creating um, creating developments that respect and incorporate biodiversity into them from the outset. And so I believe that they're, they're working on a couple of sites in Melbourne coming up soon. Hopefully I haven't announced that on top of that they wasn't supposed to be known, but <laughs> they've been working on this concept of biodiversity sensitive urban design for quite a while. And so they're now um, going to be doing some on-site practical work on it, which is really exciting. And so there's a really nice framework around how to go about creating great habitat for wildlife from the outset of a, a subdivision going into place. So hopefully a really great, I think a really great series of case studies of, of how peop- how developers can create these great spaces, working with experts in that field with like on the ground and creating spaces that people want to be in as well as, as, well as wildlife. Now I'm just going to try and find where are we? Melbourne, let's be Melbourne-centric here, is actually they've done another initiative, which I'll put a link in here for you. So the city of Melbourne realizing that the plane trees aren't the most (laughs) exciting source of of food for native mammals and birds and and everything else and insects because pretty much nothing eats them. They've started this initiative of planting native mistletoes in the plane trees throughout the city of uh, Melbourne. And because they know through my husband's work that mistletoes are a keystone species in promoting diversity, especially in insects. And then, therefore, birds. So they're, they've started this trial to to high grade, I guess, diversity in the urban landscape. A shot of, of goodness. <laughs> so go Melbourne. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, we're about to work with City of Melbourne on a project too, looking at how with RMIT and University of Melbourne, in looking at some planting of corridors for birds in some of the key parks mm. in Melbourne and banding fairy wrens and things and looking at how they're moving or not moving across those parks and using citizen scientists to report lovely things, the little banded birds. Very lovely. Oh, lovely. Yes, yeah, <laughs> Melbourne are doing some great things at the moment. Yeah, it's really good. And and actually they've got a really committed team. Yeah, you know, I was lucky enough to study with some of the people in Uni Melbourne, City of Melbourne, with their uh, in their uh, parks groups. Uh, Maggie, you, you, you mentioned about the missiles, hey? And uh, it's not that many years ago that I was working in, Parks and Gardens, and 
the very first yeah. things that we would cut out <laughs> when you, you know, is you'd get the ARB crew out and take all the mistletoe out. And just simply because I don't think anyone really was thinking to, you're thinking because we were all focused on the health of the tree and the mm. risks involved with an unhealthy tree. There's always so, that. So the best way to think about a mistletoe is if you've got a dog with fleas, are the fleas going to kill the dog? No, because they're just living there. If the dog dies, you don't blame the fleas. No. So if a tree has mistletoe, it's fine. But if a tree has too many mistletoes, you've got to go, well, what's wrong with the tree, the, the surrounding environment that's making it so susceptible to its version of the flea? And just that train of thought, no, that yeah. didn't come about until quite recently. Yeah, no, it was always. I mean, you've got heat stress because you've got paving or roads and root systems under those and, and – Maybe there's been new cabling go through for the internet and all those kind of things. But, of course, the problem is the mistletoe. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 in a way, it's really positive that the eyes are now being opened about mm. all of these issues. But, of course, with trees and whatnot, they take street trees that are 80 years old, take 20 years to die. So... A lot yeah. of the time you don't know that the damage has been done until mm. it's way too late to, to save them. So, well, <laughs> I think we've I think we've been ar around the block and back oval as well. Is there anything that you think we may have missed out in our wine-raging discussion? I'm going to put all these links. Did here. you put that link in for the, the Bird Life Australia fact sheety thing? Yep, and yeah. I've got the, the, the AWE .gov.au slash lay slash contact, that one. Um, yeah, so there's a contact me thing and, yeah. and it opens up into a page and you can put your very sharply worded, here's what you need to know about X. Yeah, and then we've got Holly's one for the um, threatened species biodiversity sensitive urban design mm -hmm. and that grassland certainly looks like near near my place we've got a lot of the remnant grasslands in melbourne and then you're under misunderstood magical mistletoes of australia i'm looking forward to reading that's an abc link and then you got a youtube uh, one what's that one maggie i think that's the abc gardening australia did uh, a whole thing on it as well okay now holly i know i always put you on the spot i'd reached out to james about invasive species Invasive Species Council. So are you happy to tackle invasive species next? Uh, I haven't got a confirmation from James yet, but he did say that he'd be happy, happy to chat. We just don't have a date. So That's I'm okay. To, I'm going to pop that again at him and see if we can get into it. Maggie, cool. what else? tell us about how you became Turn Girl. So... I originally trained to in mammalian reproduction with the intent of becoming a vet and I became a vet nurse and decided that I didn't really like how people treated their animals. They're really quite awful to I loved working with the animals but yeah that that wasn't that was the end of a deal so I'm like was casting around to where to go and I stumbled upon the roseate tern which is in the United States an endangered species and I did my master's on them. And when I moved to Australia, I did my master's on the crested tern. And they're the best birds on the planet. Ooh, have, a, have a blue with you about the, the fairy. Well, uh, uh, the apostle bird has to be the close second, oh, though. Yeah, yeah the, they are yeah, very and, cool. And because, chuffs uh, well, because Lousy Jack. It took it's me. It's a great name, isn't it? It took me months of digging around to figure out where in the heck that came from. And apparently it comes from this story that was brought over by Cornish settlers. So they, they have the this like fairy tale, Jack um, and his 11 brothers. And it's like a Sleeping Beauty sort of one of those fairy tales where you, well, all the brothers try and do something. And the lousy Jack, the youngest brother, wins the princess in the end because he, and he uses oh. the... He uses the thorns on the on the hedge to scratch his lice and he's able to get through and save the princess sort of thing. And it was like, 
what? And because there's 12 of them, 12 Apostle Birds and Lousy Jack. And I'm like, that is the best story. Wow. That, Goodness. That needs to be aired far more widely. Yeah. 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 So no, that's my, my project is to track down a, the actual written story of this so that I can find out who Lousy Jack is. Yeah. But they're cool. That's that's a ripper. Holly, what's what's the latest birds in backyards going on? Ah, uh, what isn't going on? So rodenticides are a big issue that I'm still working on with Maggie and Rob in WA and within bird life itself. So we are waiting for some sorry? Is the bat the battle still isn't won. Is that no. Oh, oh there's a long way to go. Gee, I, I thought that the that the action had been stopped, but there's still the pressure so, from the ag groups. Oh no! So, so the New South Wales government was not allowed to use all that bromodialone that is now sitting somewhere to be cut. <laughs> I have no idea. No one what knows. The plan will be for that for those products, but they were not allowed to use it in the broad scale that they had applied to the APVMA, which is the Australian. Um, Pesticides and Veterinary Medicine Association. They're the ones that decide what chemicals are allowed to be used, how they have to be used, how they're labelled, etc. So they're the ones that said, no, New South Wales government, you cannot use bromodialone in this um, capacity. They have undertaken a, rodentic- a review into rodenticides in Australia last year. So BirdLife, amongst many other people and organisations, put forward submissions. One thing that we called for is for those second-gen rodenticide products to be removed from public sale. So we don't think, as I'm sure Maggie does as well, that those that all of those various Ratsaki, Talon, Big Cheese products should be available for individuals to buy, that there are right. specific uses for them in some cases. So we didn't talk about island conservation particularly, but that's where those products are mm. and have a place to be used. Um, so we still want to see those products removed from public sale. That review is has wound up, but decisions have not been made yet they're still reviewing everything so bird life is still calling for those products to be taken off the shelves we're still going to be very active in that space so that actforbirds.org.au website people can sign up and find out information to be kept in the loop we are testing powerful owl livers at the moment we're waiting for the test results to look at extents of um, rodenticides in very urban powerful owls from sydney to see whether they are showing up in these birds that we now know are eating rats and, of course, eat possums. Um, so we're waiting for those test results to come back as well in powerful owls. We've always got Birds in Backyard surveys ongoing, so people can also jump on to birdsinbackyards.net, go through to bird data and tell us what's in their garden. And otherwise, yeah, they can follow us on social media, Urban Birds Oz on Twitter, Birds in Backyards on Instagram or join the Birds in Backyards Facebook group and we'll have a newsletter out at the end of next month if people want to sign up for that too. It's busy. Busy, Maggie, busy. what's your current project? I am working on flies in swift parrots and orange-bellied parrots. So in my research world, I'm a uh, parasitologist uh, and I look at ectoparasites on, on birds. So yes, looking at lice, looking at flat flies. Okay. Just in, in the, the microscope. <laughs> in 25 words or less, flat flies are important because... So the Hippoboscidae are a group of flies that are found all over the world. So they infest mammals and birds and everything and they're blood-sucking things. But they run the very real risk of spreading disease. And one of the big diseases that parrots get is something called beak and feather disease. And so we're examining how much they share beak and feather disease around when they bite. And, of course, there's wow. an episode of the bird emergency about beak and feather disease with the fantastic Dr Johanna Mark. My next episode of the bird emergency is about a bird that lost the battle, the Carolina parakeet. Oh, yes. With, I did a great interview with Kevin Bergio from the New York chapter of the Audubon Society. I believe. Mm-hmm. And after that, we're talking more bird influenza pandemic and whatnot with Michelle Villa from University of Sydney. So um, we've got it's doom and gloom everywhere you look. <laughs> what? I've got some good news stories coming up too. We're talking about translocations coming up and, uh, yeah, 
more waiters and whatnot. So, um, yeah. Thanks, Maggie. It's really great to have met you. Yeah, thanks. I hope, I hope we can, thanks for having me on. I hope we can find a reason to chat again. Holly, you're the mainstay of the of, <laughs> of the of these little conversations. Thanks for been the a pleasure. who have been watching and commenting, Tess particularly. I really I know you two can't see the eyeballs, but we've been having eyeballs, so that's great. great. We even got um, we yeah. got a love heart and we got some comments. And of course there if you're looking at the screen, Grant at Bird Emergency on Twitter if you'd like some snark and some sark. As well as uh, I like to retweet as much birdie information as I can find from around the world. Just put up with my rant. And, yep, this will be up on the on the YouTube channel if you want to re-watch it. And, of course, the podcast version of this will be out very soon. And as Nick mentioned to me yesterday, he got through quite a few episodes when he was driving 2,000 kilometres before he went and take took some photos of the black kite. So, hey, Nick, here's another an hour and a half. Uh, how many kilometres are we going to get there? I reckon you'll probably get almost 200 kilometres out of this one, buddy. <laughs> oh, and thanks. Oh, there's someone dropping in very late. Oh, and a thumbs up. Um, oh, and a comment. Hang on before we go. Oh. Oh, thanks, Natalie. I'm scared of birds. Well, everybody's got some kind of a nightmare. I hope you're not scared of chickens. That's all I can say. Chickens really aren't birds. They're just weird. Dinosaurs, aren't they, really? Well, all birds are dinosaurs. Well, that's right. Which, no, no, let's not even. I mean, the cassowary. That's pretty, pretty terrifying. But what about Natalie's just said she's scared of roosters, but not chickens. How about cassowaries and emus, Natalie? Let's, get, let's give us an update on there because, <laughs> because we're all hanging out for that. Uh, oh, we're all adorable. Have a good night. Oh, well, oh. You're, you're obviously on the other side of the world somewhere. Nice to meet Very you, Very cool. Thanks, Holly. BirdLife Australia, Urban Birds Program Manager, Birds in Backyards, if you want to check out the website. Oh, that's what I didn't tell you. Holly, this week I'm talking to Tegan. Yay! From BirdLife WA. And we're going to be Wonderful. talking about last year's great Australian backyard Aussie bird count. Yep. And talking about what we found out from last year and what some of the uh, the hopes are for this year. And Natalie, yeah, it's kind of excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.